didn't hear me a while ago, we are going to have a baptizing after church uh, down at the river. Um, and it, it's up and it's cold, but Owen wants to go forth. So we're going we're gonna to get her done. So if you want to come, it's down at uh, Steve and Alicia West's house back in behind there. Um, so uh, Alicia said the river's up. We shouldn't have to go in it very far. So that'll be good. I thought about just pushing him, pushing him in. Yeah. Yeah. So I told Crystal, I said, I might just push him in. That way I don't have to get in there. No, I won't do that to you, and I'll get in with you, buddy. All right. And also, um, Sam Atwell is going to get baptized as well at some point, and they actually talked about doing that Christmas morning after church. So... Uh, don't know what they're going to do there. Uh, man, later in the year it gets, the colder it gets. That'll be good. So uh, anyway, if you want to see me probably gasp and complain, come watch. All right. If you want to turn that on, Stephen. Oh, it's on. All right. Um, before I begin this morning, if I may make an amendment. Uh, last week I, I was following along my notes and my notes were wrong at the end. So if I got anybody confused, I didn't put the sermon up on YouTube as of yet uh, because of this, because I knew I was, I was confused. So I know that you might have been confused. Hopefully you went home and, and got your Bible out and seen where I went wrong. Uh, it was a matter of numbering in my notes. I usually don't number things, and I did in this particular instance. And so there, I want to just clarify before I go any further this morning, there are not, and I did not mean to imply that there was, and I knew that there wasn't, but there are not two Michaels. How many of y'all thought that that's what I was getting at? A few of you did. I know a few of you did because I, I, I heard from you. Uh, so uh, that is not what I meant to imply. I forgot to put anything about Gabriel in there. And uh, so... My brain just kind of froze up, and then, if you would, I was kind of like a deer in the headlights. I kind of panicked when I didn't know what I had done. And so instead of just stopping and resetting, I tried to go on, and so I kind of got it goofed up. So Michael, the archangel, he is the only one, okay, uh, that is mentioned in Scripture by name. And uh, so, and he is also, if I may just say this for clarification's uh, sake, uh, he is also the guardian of Israel, and that's kind of where I got goofed up last week. So uh, he is the archangel. He is the one that, that comes at the, you know, the, uh, when Jesus bring, you know, takes out the church, uh, the voice of the archangel, uh, but he's also the guardian of Israel, as I gave you scripture on that uh, last week. So then, that being said, let's move on. And I want to continue on. I did not, honestly, I did not mean for these, me I had a whole different message kind of in my mind prepared the week before, uh, or last week. And it kind of took a turn this direction because I felt like, you know, if we're going to talk about God's order of things, we need to talk about it completely and not just, you know, uh, what we can see and, and what we uh, are familiar with. Uh, because I felt like it would be an injustice uh, to the Word of God and to the, to the things of God to leave out this heavenly order. Okay, so uh, notice this morning I'm talking about heaven's order. Uh, so anyway, let's look here before uh, we go any further. I want us to speak of heaven's order where we're, and, and I want you to know we're diving into things that we can't see or that we necessarily feel. You know, we, there's thing, how many of y'all know there's things going on behind the scenes of your life that you don't necessarily know are happening? How many of y'all believe that's true? For sure it is. Listen, there's a whole a lot of things, I think, that we don't see working behind the scenes of our life that we, you know, we don't see them, so we don't really think about them very much, but they're, it doesn't mean that they're not happening. It doesn't mean that they're not real, and it doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't have quite a lot to say about them. Uh, I want to say this. I gave you a lot of Scripture last week. I've got, you know, some more Scripture today, but I'm just scratching the surface of all this, and for me to sit here and say that I know everything there is to know about it would be, would be dishonest. 
uh, for me to stand here and say that, that anyone knows everything there is to know about it would be dishonest. Uh, there's a lot of things that go on that we're not going to understand here in this life. And that's why Paul the Apostle wrote and said that right now we look through a glass dimly or darkly. We can't see very plainly. There's certain things that we can see, but there's a lot of things that are just vague to us and, and, and hard to understand and hard to comprehend. Uh, things that we can't even see, period. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not so. So uh, before we get into Scripture, I just want to say a few things about that. This doesn't mean that they're not important, these things, these heavenly things. doesn't mean that they're not important, that they're not at work in our world or in our lives on a daily basis. What we know of the heavenly order, I want you to understand something, only comes from the written word of God. Anything else, if it's not of the written word of God and it doesn't line up with Scripture, man's ideas about things, Hollywood's ideas about things, author's ideas about things, theological ideas about things, you need to make sure that they line up with the word of God because the word of God is all we got on these things. Anything else really should be looked at in some skepticism or disregarded entirely. I, I, I thought about this morning, we were kind of Grant and I, since Dan ha isn't here this morning, Grant and I were trying to work on the computer and, and put some things up here, and, and do you know how hard it is to get a, I don't even know how to put this in the right word, but I want to use it as an example, I told Grant, I said, let's look for something, since we're talking about heaven's order, let's look for a picture or a background that's heavenly. It's ridiculous some of the ideas that people have about heavenly things. And we could come up with nothing that just didn't look ridiculous. So we just come up with something plain that has, you know, and, and that, that works best because I don't want to misrepresent uh, what man's ideas is about heaven and about God's order of things. Uh, I mean, some of these, you see, how many of y'all have seen the little angels, little baby angels? I never understood that with wings flying around, you know? Uh, listen, man's ideas about things don't matter. What matters is what the Word of God says. Amen? And that is our authority, and we need to be careful. We need to be careful uh, that if it doesn't line up with Scripture, uh, then it should be just disregarded. Okay? So then, let's look at the first passage of Scripture. Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on this message. Dear God in heaven, we come before you today. We just want to thank you, Father, for this blessed day. And, Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you, Lord, for their, Lord, their attendance here. And I just I want to thank you, God, that uh, even when I make mistakes, uh, that, Lord, they give me grace. And, Lord, I just give you praise for that. And, Father, I ask you, Lord Jesus, today that you would bless your word, bless me as your, your speaker, that, God, that you would help me to be able to preach and to minister the truth out of the word of God, that, God, that you would take me out of the way, and that your spirit would have full leadership and authority in this place today. Father, speak to these people according to your will and according to their need. And Lord, I'd ask you, God, if there's anyone here that has not received Jesus as Savior, that God, today, that they would be spoken to by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, that they would come to the knowledge of Christ. Father, we love you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's look here this morning in the first passage of Scripture. So let me just say this about going back to the last point, that what we know of the heavenly order only comes from the written word. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's, and, and last week I spoke on the, the topic of angels. I'm going to go back to that at some point. I know the holidays are coming up and, and we're going to do, you know, things a little bit different for the next few weeks. Uh, but when we get back to it, we're going to get back on track. And I want to talk about that subject some more. It's, it's a subject I have never touched as far as I know, or very little. And I've not heard very many other people touch on it either. And part of the reason I think that, that I feel that the, the Holy Spirit is driving me into that direction, at least to spend a little time on it. How many of y'all want to go to battle for somebody that you don't know anything about? I mean, how many of y'all want to go to battle? Let's just put in a physical, you know, kind of example. 
How many of y'all are going to be willing to go to battle, physical battle, for an organization that you don't know why it exists? You don't know what it's about. You don't know any of its, you know, ideologies, or uh, you don't know its program. You don't know what it stands for. You don't know who is leading. And you might say, well, I know Jesus, and, and, and because of that, I, I know who I'm fighting for. I get that, but how well do you know your leader? How well do you know God? If we're going to go to battle for God, I think we ought to get to know God as much as we possibly can. Amen? Amen. And the reason for that is, is because the better I know him, the more I'm going to want to go to battle with him. Because the more I'm going to trust him, and the more I'm going to be able to trust his leadership for my life, and his leadership for the direction that, that life is taking me, that God is in control. And because I know who God is, and I know about his order of things, I know uh, about his program for things, it's going to make me very much more comfortable to face the situations that life uh, may throw up uh, at me. So uh, does that make sense to everybody this morning? I, uh, I think I quoted something, and i got to be careful here because I'm going off total memory. This is how I get myself into trouble. But to have a, to, you know, to say you know somebody without knowing anything about them, that is a, a that's shallow. You know, that's not a deep, intimate relationship. Or to say that you know something about somebody, but you don't know them, Personally, that again is a, is a big problem. I not only want to know about God, I want to know God. Amen? There's lots of people that know about God, but they don't really have a deep relationship with God. Amen? And I, I don't only want to know God, I want to know about God. Because there's, there's a lot of Christians who know God, but they don't know much about Him. So both things are a problem. I want us to have a deep intimate, personal, everyday, walking relationship with God. That way I know how to follow him and, and, and know how to do it the right way and know how to handle situations when they arise. So then, uh, speaking of that, what, you know, man thinks or is it, you know, experience must line up with Scripture. And if it doesn't, as I've already said, it must be it should be disregarded. And let's look at some scripture. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 says, Let no man beguile you. And I read this passage last week. But let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which they have not seen, vainly puffed up in their fleshly mind. So he's saying, listen, don't fall into this idea that angels should be worshipped. Hey, people that say they know something about the program of God, and, and yet it doesn't line up with Scripture. Paul is warning this church, don't buy into it. Don't fall into their trap. Don't get into their false ideas about things. Don't get into their false doctrines. Be very careful about the doctrine of which you hold to. Make sure that it lines up with Scripture. Amen? Now then, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 and 15 says, And no marvel for Satan. This is why we need to be careful. Believe it, it's true. Satan knows what it is to be an angel of light because he was created. And we're going to get to that scripture here in just a little bit. Because he was created in perfection, but because of his rebellion against God, he was rejected. But he knows what it is to look like an angel of light. And the scripture says, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. How many of y'all know that I could, I could be one of those? Amen. That, that I could be an agent of Satan who disguises himself as the minister of God. There's plenty of them out there. Many cults have been born by people uh, like this. Many false religions and doctrines have been taught uh, because of this. Listen, Satan himself knows how to manipulate Scripture and ideas of men. So don't be surprised when they are transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. 
Don't ever forget it. Listen to me. If, I, if, you, if you got somebody up here, uh, they are being led by Satan to preach a false, false doctrine. Understand this. One day, one day, they may deceive you. They may trick you, but they will not fool God. And one day they will stand before Almighty God and they will give an answer to what they have preached. Amen? To what they have taught. But I want you to understand the reason I give these scriptures is uh, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, this is what can happen. Satan knows how to manipulate. Satan knows how to deceive. He is a master of it. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this about Satan's deception. He says that he is the father of liars. Amen? I want you to understand something. He, he's the first to tell a lie, and he knows how to do it well. And I want you to understand something as well, that he has had thousands of years of human involvement. Involvement, let me rephrase that, involvement with human beings. He knows how to, how to lie to them. He's very good at it. He's had lots of practice. Okay? Don't ever forget that. This is why it is so important that we learn Scripture. This is why it's so important that we get it in our heart. Remember what the psalmist said, Thy word, God, your word, have I hid in my heart. Why? You all know the rest of that verse? That I might not sin against God, that I might not sin against thee. So the psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Listen, hide his word in your heart. How do I do that? You got to read it. You not only got to read it, you got to meditate on it. You got to think about it. Not only do you got to think about it, you got you to memorize it over time. You don't have to memorize it all today. A little at a time. I've been at this for a very long time. Okay, I've been preaching for a very long time and I still have very much to learn. But you need to hide your word or hide his word in your heart. You get it in there. You learn it. Do you have to learn it word for word? See, I think sometimes people get real discouraged with, with learning the Bible because they get this idea in their head that I've got to learn every word and I've got to remember where every period and every comma is at. And I've got I've to remember every syllable just exactly right. Listen, get the principle of the verse in your heart. If you can't say it word for word just right, say it as close as possible. Okay, listen, you don't have to have it perfect, but you got to have it in your heart. I used to think, and I, don't, I didn't mean to get on this, but give me just a moment on this. I think it's fairly important. I used to think when I was a younger uh, preacher or Christian, for that matter, that if I memorized the verse and I didn't get one word right, that was almost sacrilegious or something. It's not. Listen, if you don't get every syllable just right, it's okay. Get it in your heart. Get the principle in your heart right. Don't get the verse in your wrong, heart all turned around and wrong, but get the principle right. Amen? All right, let's look on. So this is why it's important that we learn Scripture. And before we look at the order of the things of God, the order of heaven, we need to understand their origin. Because I, I thought about this yesterday when I was working on this sermon. I thought, is it enough just to know about them? I, I need to know why they are. Where did they come from? Okay, what is it all about? The better I understand it, the more I am going to be able to trust. Okay, the, more, the better I'm going to be able to follow uh, God as he leads in my life. So the origins of things. I want you to know this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Grant gets it pulled up there. It says, for, and here's the origin, not only of the order of heaven, but the origin of all things. Amen? Now, I know that we say we all believe this, and we all know this, but I want you to understand, there's, there's scripture on this. It's foundational truth of the Christian faith. You see, there's some people that think we're just here by accident, by chance. We're not. God put us here. Listen, some people think that you exist just because of chance, because of DNA, or, or because, you know, 
whatever, but it's, listen, you're here by divine appointment. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. Amen? Listen, if you're breathing here this morning, God loves you and God has a purpose for your life. Now, you may never fulfill that purpose and you may go your own direction, but I am telling you, God has a purpose for your existence. For by him were all things, all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, that are visible and invisible. In other words, physical and spiritual. And understand that it's all created by God. Whether they be thrones, and this is speaking of, of heavenly things, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. Hey, listen, if it wasn't for God, all things would just fall apart into disorder. Amen? Listen, if it wasn't for God, nothing would exist. I love the thought. In our, our young adult uh, Bible study here, you know, several weeks ago, the fellow there, and I won't be able to quote him just right, but I loved how he put it about creation. And he, he, he put it like this. He said, nothing before anything was created, nothing leaned in close with its ear, listening for what it would become. Oh, I'm, I, that just drew a picture in my mind that even nothingness listens to the voice of God to see what he would make of it. Listen, God can speak things into existence. He did. Listen, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Amen? Amen. God spoke it into existence. Now then, looking on, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 40. It says, there are also celestial bodies, and I don't ever say that word right, celestial, I always want to put an R in there, bodies and terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial, celestial is one, I'm going to say it like that, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Okay, listen, there is heavenly things, there are earthly things. Listen, there is a universe and there is an outer, there's planets and solar systems and galaxies that God has put into place. He's so awesome and he's so powerful and he is so good, amen? And then there's our solar system and the planets and, and our, the planet itself that we live on and that we call home. Listen, God created all those things. There are celestial things and there are terrestrial things. There are earthly things and there are heavenly things. God is the Father. And so let's look at Ezekiel 28, 15. One last thing on this. And the reason I put this in here is because I want you to understand about these heavenly things. How many of y'all know that Satan was a created being? And if Satan was a created being, all the angels and the things that we talked about last week, they too are created beings. They are not eternal. In other words, they didn't exist in eternity past. There was a point in time where God spoke them into existence too. Okay, they are created by God. Now they are eternal in the sense that they will go on forever. But there was a beginning for them. I am telling you, there is no beginning before God because there is no before God. Now, I know it's so hard for us to wrap our feeble human minds around that concept, and I'm not going to spend time trying to dwell on it today because it'll just give you a headache. But I'm telling you, God is forever in the past. He is forever in the future. Amen? He is, in e he is eternal. And everything that we know that exists in our universe, God spoke it into existence. Listen, he says this of, of Lucifer, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. And the thing I want to emphasize here this morning is that he was created. Amen? He was created. Now then, let's go on. As far as the origin of things, I want you to know that God is the Father. Now, this is another hard thing for us humans to wrap our mind around. 
But we need to understand that God is the Father, He is the Son, and He is the Holy Spirit. Amen? God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They three are one God. Amen? Now, it's hard, but I always, I, I know we've used the example before, but just think about the, the, the let's, let's go a little deeper. Let's think about the human creation. God created us with a physical body. The scripture says that he gave us a soul and he gave us a spirit. You see, human beings are created in the image of God in this sense that we are a triune being. We are body, soul, and spirit. The egg is a, is a simple e example of this triune thing being one. You got, you got a shell, you got a white, and you got a yolk. It's one egg, three parts. Amen? One cannot exist properly without the other. Now then, I don't, I, again, I didn't mean to spend much time on that, but I want you to understand that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's important uh, because that scripture that we just read in Colossians speaks of that all things were created by Him and for Him. It's speaking of Jesus. And if you separate Jesus from God, you're going to say, what are you, what, what's, what's this all about? Listen, they are equals, though they be three separate parts. They are one God. Now then, let's look in St. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. St. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, In the beginning, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of the world, in the beginning of the creation. I say, in the beginning of the creation of all things. If you go back to Genesis uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, it tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? So that in the beginning was the Word capitalized, and the Word was made, was with God, and what? The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Made. Now let's look at verse 14 of this same chapter. And the Word was what? Made flesh. Who's it speaking of? What is this Word? It is Jesus. Amen? The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Genesis, and I don't have this scripture for the screen, but Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, if you go back and read it, it's capitalized. The, whole, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You see, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit were all involved in the creation. I love the thought of that passage of Scripture when it says, And darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You see, I, I want you to understand some. The earth was without form and void, it says. And the Spirit of God moved upon those things. It gives us a beautiful picture, although it's a literal creation. I don't want to spiritualize it, but there is a spiritual application to it, and that is this, that your life without God is void and without purpose. But when the Spirit of God moves upon, upon your life and you understand who Jesus is and, and you accept who Jesus is, listen, God begins to develop purpose and begins to create you into a new thing. Amen? It's a beautiful picture of salvation. Now then, let's look on. I want you to understand something, that all things are subject to God. Amen? All things are subject. How does that help me? How does it help me to know that God created all things? How does it help me to know that God, because God created, how, how does that help me in my daily walk? It helps me in my daily walk because the God that is in my life is the same God who created all things. The God who is in my life is the same God that all things are subject to. 
Therefore, I know this, as I walk with God, listen, no matter what life brings at me, he's the creator, he's got it, it's going to be okay. I don't care how bad it looks, I don't care what happens, God is in control, amen? He's got it. Now then, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, and all things... Again, notice, all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now we could spend a lot of time talking about that, you know, us being the ministers of reconciliation, but I want us to focus this morning that all things are of God and God was in Christ. Jesus said this, I am in him, he is in me. I am in him, you are in me. Listen, I want you to understand something. God was in Christ, we are in Christ. The same God that that created all things lives in me through the person of Jesus Christ. When I received Christ, I received God, of whom all things are subject. That is good news. The angel of the Lord said, I want you, let's look on. The angel of the Lord said this to Joseph concerning the Savior's birth. We're getting right close to uh, Christmas time here. So the angel of the Lord said to Joseph concerning the Savior's birth, that his name would be Jesus. And that same passage in Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. That is so awesome. Now you might say, well, that means that God was with us while Jesus was here. God is with us because Jesus is here living in us too. He may not be here physically walking on this earth as he did after his birth, but I want you to know this, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God took up residence in your life, and God is with you every day. Amen? God is with you. God with us. And I want you to think about this concerning the birth of Jesus. When Jesus was born in that stable in Bethlehem, the Bible tells us here that it was Emmanuel, that he is, Jesus is God with us. The angel Gabriel, which I I don't know, it it doesn't tell us here in Matthew who this particular angel was. But the angel Gabriel in Luke 131 spoke to Mary concerning this same thing, that the child's name would be Jesus. And he told her, fear not, Mary, for the thing that is in you is conceived of the Holy Ghost. And you'll call his name Jesus. Now I point this out because I forgot to mention Gabriel last week. Okay, so I want to make sure and get him mentioned this week. Gabriel, I don't know. But I wonder if this isn't the same messenger that brought the message to Joseph. It doesn't list him, name him here. But I want you to know this concerning Gabriel, the angel. Who is he? He stands near the throne of God. I know that. He is a high-ranking angel. And he is used in various scriptures as a messenger of the important things of God. Now then, let's look on. I'm going to close. And looking at all these things of which I have only put a tiny scratch in the surface of, I hope that we can be encouraged to be true. Listen, I hope that we can be encouraged to be true and complete followers of Christ. Knowing that when we receive Christ, we receive the one who has power over all things. Visible and invisible. Physical and spiritual. Past, present, and future. You see, he has power over all things. All things are subject to him. 
I want you to understand something. Satan can't even do anything unless God allows him to. Amen? You might say, well, why is he allowing him to do some of the stuff? It's for your good and for his glory. Amen? It is. I know we can't see it sometimes. I know it's hard to understand. But understand something. All things are under his power and authority. That God has put all things under him. It ought to give us some comfort to know that as we walk through this world as believers, if you, if you are a believer here this morning, that the one that lives in you has power over all things. I'll need to remember that tomorrow. Amen? Most likely. I for sure before this week is over will need to remember that. Because life can throw some serious curveballs, can it? So we watch the news, we look at the world around us, and we think, oh, it's all went haywire and crazy. It's okay. God's over it all. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. As we walk... Going back to the thought of the promised land, as we walk into the promised land, remember that is, as far as here on this earth is concerned, that is life in Christ. We enter into a place of spiritual warfare. When you become a Christian, be sure and know this, when you became a Christian, you, became, you, you entered into a battlefield. Amen? You entered into a walk with God, and I promise you, you have entered into a, a walk into the promised land, but it is a land full of battles, personal, real battles. We enter into a place of spiritual warfare, and here's the good news, of which Jesus has already won the victory. And if he has the victory, then it's already mine. You understand what I'm saying? Listen, we have entered into a battlefield if you have become a believer of spiritual warfare, but Jesus has already won the victory, and if he has already won the victory, then the victory already is mine. I just need to live in it. Easier said than done, right? Huh? How many of y'all... Listen, you don't have to raise your hand. You can if you want to. But how many of y'all going through some spiritual battles right now? Just a few of you is courageous enough to raise your hand. Listen, some of them I don't want to talk about. But I'm going to tell you, they're real. Amen? And I want to say this. If you're, if you're, not, if you're not engaged in the spiritual warfare then you just ain't in the fight. If you're in the fight, if you're in the, if you're, you, I don't know how to put it, but if you're a Christian, if you're a true born again Christian, you're in a battle whether you see it or not. You're just not engaged in it. It's there and it's real. But I want you to know there is, there is, we live in hope of Christ that he has won the victory and I had the victory. Whatever you're going through, Whatever you're, you will go through, or whatever you have went through, understand this, Jesus has got it licked. Amen? He's got it licked. He's got it beat. Listen, it ain't even fair, because Jesus already has the, the, the victory. When I say it ain't even fair, you know sometimes Satan has got to step back and say, you know what, this just ain't fair. Because he loses every time when God's people trust in Christ. Amen? Every time. If you would, let's stand, please, this morning. Julie, if you'd come to the piano for just a moment.